Well, Detective Hayes. Could you tell us of your timeline of events? November 7th, 1980. Was just a case when I caught it. Yeah, I know it'd be my last. Two kids, supposed to be home by 5.30, never arrived. You almost had a clean night, man. Heaven is the same. Anything you can tell me about Will? He's quiet. I don't think he got noticed much. I'm telling you, they didn't run off. All you had to do was watch him. gone too far. Mind if you look around? How you gonna wear that badge? Got a little clip on it. You look like you haven't slept in a couple days. I never stop coming up with theories about that case. My job. There's no certainty. What well, you don't remember, you don't know you don't remember. What? What well, you don't remember. Oh, sweet. Did you think you could just go on and never once have to look back? My whole brain's a bunch of missing pieces. You ever been someplace you couldn't leave? You couldn't stay both at the same time? Things I've seen, things I know, wouldn't do anything but cause harm. A lot of people around this are dead. A lot of people gone. Most people I ever knew are gone. Whatever you think you did or didn't do, you don't deserve to suffer. It's gone too far to change. This case, it's all I could think of. I want to know the whole story. Please welcome Screen Times moderator Logan Hill and our special guests, Academy Award winning writer director Barry Jenkins and Academy Award nominated composer Nicholas Bertel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think they, they liked they, it. There's another Q&A. Otherwise, I'd just let y'all stay in. But uh, <laughs> I want to make sure we get in, get in this talk. Yeah, we got a little. We got 30 minutes to talk. We'll make the most of it. We'll try to anyway. Um, I want to say hi to everybody watching us on our Facebook live stream. If you're watching. Uh, Type your questions in the comments, and we'll try to get to a few of them. Otherwise, um, I'll be asking the questions. So yeah, we'll, I'll we'll try. Um, I, you know, I want to start because I was, we, you know, Barry, you've been getting some lovely coverage in the New York Times lately. Um, and one of my favorite pieces I've read in a while is this lovely tribute to Medicine for Melancholy. This whole run that begins and goes to the Oscars begins with a $15,000 indie film made 10 years ago. And I wanted, I wanted to quote, the, the piece is really about the impact this small film had on a generation of filmmakers. Um, and Lena Waithe was talking about what, sort of what the film meant to her. She said, you know, hey, Ava DuVernay literally handed me a DVD of it, like it was NASA's first mixtape or something. <laughs> he was speaking of the kind of writing that I wanted to do, which is to just show us in the sunlight, not positive light, not dark light, just the light of day. I mean, what's, what, what I hear in that story that's so cool, one, I mean, humbling as hell. When we made that film, I mean, I didn't think anybody would watch it. I mean, it was made for $15,000, a crew of five people in 15 days. Uh, but then the director, the writer, the cinematographer, and the editor are all the same people who were on the stage at the Oscars for Moonlight, and all the same people I went to film school with in 2003. So you're right, it is the starting point of all these things. But with Lena's quote, what I love is Lena Waithe, who's the first black woman to win an Emmy uh, for, for comedy writing um, and television, was an intern on Ava DuVernay's first $6,000 feature mm -hmm. at the time that Medicine came out. And so it's just yeah. like, it's just this cycle that we're all participating in. And it's interesting to look back because at the time I thought, nobody's gonna be checking for this little dumbass, weird ass movie. <laughs> um, but then you just have to create things and put them out into the universe and you never know where they're gonna land. Yeah, and it's amazing to see the impact it's had. Nicholas has been uh, busy himself, um, you know, just in case, you, you, you've heard all of his music, you just might know, know it was him, right? You know, 12 Years a Slave, The Big Short. This year, my, maybe running against yourself, um, doing music with a Vice, who knows, we'll see. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> um, but uh, you two, this is your second time working together. Mm -hmm. yes. And 
So nine months after the Oscars, you're already on set working on this film. Because this was the warm up, uh, that Moonlight was the warm up writing project before you took on Beale Street, right? Yeah, it was. In the summer of 2013, um, I bought a round trip ticket to Brussels, Belgium. Um, knew nothing about Brussels, just wanted to get away from my life and write. And the intent was actually to adapt this book um, into a screenplay. Um, but instead, I took the play, Terrell's play, and Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue. I thought, oh, I'll just get started writing uh, on this Moonlight thing. And then once after a couple of days, I've gotten the writing bug back. Then I'll switch to Beale Street. But after 10 days, uh, the Moonlight script was done. And so I took a train to Berlin. And then mm -hmm. I finished the trip uh, by writing this first draft over the course of four weeks. And so, yeah, they kind of companion pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, I was an idiot because I adapted this book by this amazing author without having any rights to it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I came back to the States and said, oh, hey, I adapted this James Baldwin book. Like, let's go make it. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Do you know anybody at the James Baldwin estate? I said, no. And they were like, okay, sit down. It's going to take a while. And so we decided, well, we have Moonlight. And I know Terrell. Let's go and make this while we try to figure out the rights. And so that yeah. was the path and the way the two, uh, two movies are linked. And at that point, did you know that no other American filmmaker had adapted Baldwin? I was totally ignorant, bro. Yeah. I, just, I, I picked up Beale Street and said, I'm going to go to Europe like Baldwin did, and I'm going to adapt this novel. And then when I got back, I understood the, the legacy and all the hurdles I would have to jump through. Yeah. And how many hurdles were there? How tough was it? You know, it's just interesting. It wasn't tough in the sense of like playing Super Mario Brothers 8 and trying to get to like <laughs> the end and beat the big boss. But uh, the James Baldwin estate is like a family. It's a, and they're protecting his legacy. And so I think in order to be trusted uh, with the source material, I had to become a part of the family, um, which took, I mean, to be honest, like three and a half, four years. Um, but we were making Moonlight while that was happening. And the beauty of it was, I think because I had already taken this bet on myself, it's the, usually you go to an author or an estate and you go, this is what I plan to do. This is how it's going to be. I promise. Give me the rights for a dollar. You know, instead, I said, I've already done it. I went by myself. I adapted the thing. I'm going to show you exactly what I plan to do. And I will sit here and wait and come and meet as many people as I have to. And it's not going to change. This is exactly what I plan to do unless you decide it needs to change. I will work with you. And so in that sense, it just took time for them to mm -hmm. get to know me and me to get to know them. Yeah, and did they feel that it needed to change in any way? Was there any of that back and forth? I'm sure there there, no, you know, there it's often is. It's right? interesting, no, it, it wasn't. They, they saw that what I was doing was very faithful to the novel, and I learned many years later, like actually right before we started production, this package just showed up. Because the James Baldwin estate, man, is very old school. So I printed <laughs> the script, sent it to DC and New York, and then a week later, a letter came in the mail Actually, like typewritten, like somebody had sent it a typewriter. <laughs> and it came back to me, said, hey, Mr. Jenkins, we hear you. We think you're very interesting, and be patient. And so that went on for years. And then after I had the rights, and after we were right about to start physical pre-production in New York, I was still in LA, a package just showed up on my doorstep. And I opened the package, I'm like, what is this? And it was this, this notebook that you guys have probably read about at some point, this notebook of James Baldwin literally sitting down to do his adaptation of Bill Street back in 1978. Mm -hmm. and, and what I saw in the few pages that existed was the script I sent them when I came back from Europe, it was very much in league, in concert, and mm -hmm. spirit with the script that he had envisioned himself. And so all along, they had decided, oh, okay, this guy's gonna do it the way that we think it should be done. But they had to really see if I had the patience, the endurance, to, to understand that <laughs> yeah. I really, really meant it, that I wanted to make this film. And so when we won the Oscars with Moonlight, it was like proof positive, I'm not gonna go off and do something really massive or something really lucrative. I'm gonna be here, like I said, and we're gonna make a Bill Street could talk. Yeah. And let's, let's, let's talk, Nicholas. At what point did you know you are gonna be working together again? I yeah, hoped I, 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 hoped I would get a chance to work with you. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, when we started talking about Beale Street before you shot the film. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I had read the book and I read the script. Um, and I remember the first conversations we had, Barry said, you know, actually one of the things I really love about working with Barry is early on he has these very strong kind of initial instincts of just feelings that we're going to maybe explore in a project. And with this, the early idea, I remember the first thing you said you were saying you were hearing brass and horns and this sort of idea of jazz and you know that was kind of what I what I got from you and then Barry just lets me kind of go off and do my thing which is really exciting because he goes to make the movie and while he's making the movie I start brainstorming things and experimenting with sounds and um, and then we kind of connected again once you were done mm -hmm. and 
then you know, there's this mystery of the film scoring process, which I'm constantly fascinated with, which is just you really don't know what's going to work until you put something up against the picture. It's, exactly. this, it's this alchemy that you really sort of don't know where things are going to go. And I think one of the exciting things is you know, getting to work with someone like Barry, where we go on this, this journey together, and we, we kind of together discover what the sound of the film is. Mm -hmm. And so initially, I'm so fascinated with you know, this, this. This begins with a quote that you know uh, is very musical, right? It's talking about the sound of drums and that mm -hmm. this is going to that it, this is a very loud place, right? You know, um, this score is in many ways very delicate, not very loud. Was there ever were there ever past where you said we're not going down that route? We're not doing 1974 period. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. What's the list of? So I'm, I'm going to spill some tea, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 as the kids say. The last thing, the last thing <laughs> in the film uh, was that quote. The last thing in the film was that quote. So the film, the score, the acting, everything came before. Got it. And then the quote came last. Uh, I think the quote has fidelity to the book and the score has fidelity to the film. Um, we didn't start out trying to uh, reflect the, the period of black cinema, which would have been very like Curtis Mayfield, um, like uh, black exploitation. Uh, instead, we were leaning into, I think what's in that quote also, uh, I think literally, semantically, uh, Mr. Baldwin is describing sounds, but he also says, my father was a jazz man. You know, he mm -hmm. was born in New Orleans. And so that was where, just from doing research on Baldwin, where I took my cues from. In the title, you could say that it wanted to be a very blues-heavy score, um, but there's this idea of romanticism in Baldwin's writing and in Tish's voiceover that I decided would be best to lean into. And at first I said to Nick, yeah, this should be horns and, um, and brass. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, what I love about working with Nick is he doesn't dictate you know, what the sound will be. Once the footage starts coming in, he always writes a few things before the film, uh, before he sees any footage. And in Moonlight, that became Little's theme was something Nick wrote, literally not seeing a frame of footage. That was just him reading the script, getting in the vibe, and presenting me with choices. But uh, with this film, we started out with all this brass and horns, but as we started watching the actors, we realized that the sound of Tish was coming through strings. And so I think Nick had started composing for brass, but then his wife is here somewhere uh, who plays all the cello Caitlin on the film. Here, yeah. She started playing uh, these brass compositions with strings. And that's what you see over the first half of the film. Yeah. And so where did that begin with you? you know, if, if you're looking at something, you're thinking, oh, this isn't quite right. The dailies are coming in, or you're beginning to see. Did you see dailies, or was it more just waiting for? Did you see dailies? I I actually did have access to some dailies, yeah. um, mm -hmm. but I really prefer to start getting sequences and, and, and like a cut, right. you know, because then you can actually start sort of living with the story and living with what the, what the film is going to become. And I think, you know, it is this very sort of almost like mystical thing where you, you're following these feelings that are almost, I think when, when things work, it's almost like a physical kind of a sensation. And Barry and I, I mean, we work really closely together where we'll go for sometimes days, days on end where we'll sit in a room together and we'll you know, try things out, we'll experiment, we'll put things up. Again. And it's really cool when for like three days, nothing works. And then on that yeah. last day, <laughs> exactly. everything just reveals itself. <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's, it's like, what do you call it? It's like a binge and purge where there'll be days where nothing works and then somehow, <laughs> through all this exploration, you know, we'll have four cues just present yeah. themselves in, in one day. And it's fascinating, too, what you do from reading a script and what you come up with, and then what works with the movie. So like, for example, with Little's theme that Barry mentioned, you know, that was something that I had read the script for Moonlight. And when I read it, I thought it was the most beautiful piece of poetry. I, I, thought, it, I thought it was like a, a beautiful poem. And um, I remember I wrote a piece, and I called it Piano and Violin Poem, because I was sort of trying to channel this idea of like, what would a piece of music sound like if it was like a poem? And that was Little's theme. And you know, Barry was like, it's in the movie. You know, that, my <laughs> demo is actually in the movie. It was just, you know, I had my friend Tim Fain. Your demo the was nominated yeah. for an Oscar. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> 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 not in the movie. I was, I was just happy you liked it. I was like, oh, I'm so happy this works, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but I, what's interesting is on Beale Street, the, the pieces that I wrote, the first piece I wrote um, was this, uh, these chords and this melody, and it was for flugelhorns, trumpets, French horn, cornet, and it's not in the movie. Um, well, but it is. But it is, because, it is. exactly, because, so we, it was missing something, it was missing these strings, and so I started playing it on strings, on cellos, on bass, and, um, and then weaving it together. And actually, so the melody you hear from that first piece, you, you actually hear it when Tish and Fani are walking at the very beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. You hear it multiple times throughout the movie. Um, and then as the movie you know, evolved for us, 
there were places where the brass and the strings would actually merge. So at the end of the film, it, it's also philia. It is philia, exactly. It is. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, inside no, of baseball. So. We yeah. we named the pieces of many of the pieces in the score. We actually named after the ancient Greek terms for love. Um, so there's a piece called agape. There's a piece called eros, eros philia, storg. Storg, exactly. You know, the idea that the film is exploring all of these different kinds of love, love, you know, erotic love, romantic love, uh, love that uh, parents have for their children. Which is James Baldwin's way of saying black folks have romantic love, uh, familial love, <laughs> brotherly in. love, all types of love, bro. <laughs> right, Nick? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and Barry, if you were talking about what love sounds like in this film, what, what did you want love to sound like in this movie as you were going through that iterative process? It was funny. I, uh, at the beginning, I wasn't thinking of what love sound, sounded like. Uh, what, what I love about working with Nick is we just need a starting point mm -hmm. and a trajectory or direction. And usually that is going to lead us not to the destination, but all these other things are going to shoot out from it. And so to me, it was just about, it was more about the political uh, tone of the film, to be honest. That's mm -hmm. where the whole thing with the brass came from. Um, but as you know, being on set and watching the actors, and then of course building the sequences, as Nick said, it became very clear that the blend of this sort of like this jazz, these horns, which, you know, is I think I heard I was in Argentina a couple of years ago, and I got into this this argument slash discussion uh, with these very upper class Argentines about what has America ever given to the world, and uh, the only answer we could all agree on was jazz. <laughs> and where the hell did jazz come from? When black folks got them horns. And so I was like, you know what, let's take this jazz and let's make this the bedrock of the piece. And then it was like, and what else can jazz do? Jazz can take cellos and make that represent this really deep, rich, lush love. And so it was like, again, we just had a starting point and then on the trajectory to our final destination, all these things shot out from it. Yeah, let's talk about one sequence. I love, I love just getting specific. So maybe we can trace you know, the development of a scene. And we were talking about this marvelous you know, 10 to 12 minute, how long is that, that scene? So 12 minutes, yeah. 12 minute scene, sitting at the table, two old friends talking, and gradually revealing themselves to each mm -hmm. other. Um, what was the initial pass of that scene? Uh, you mean musically or just? Yeah, in, in well, I, well, I guess in general. Like, well, I mean, and then we'll for, get to music. For, for me, uh, that scene was very important. And the book is broken up into two different sections. So you'll be in it for like 20 pages, you go away from it for 40, then you come back to it for another 10 pages. Um, but it felt like with this film, uh, because of what Fani is going through, you wanted something that somebody who could in a flesh and blood way embody uh, what potentially might be awaiting him. And so I thought, oh, let's just put it all together and make it the midpoint of the film. And so Brian Tyree Henry, Mr. Paperboy, Paperboy shows up. <laughs> and, uh, and to me, what that sequence represented was uh, oftentimes when two black men see each other, and maybe I'm not, I'm not white, so I don't know, maybe when two white men see each other too, um, you know, you see each other, you go, hey, how you doing? It's like, I'm good. And then it's like, okay, cool. But if you spend more time together, like another 30 minutes, an hour, it's like, I'm good, and, and then an hour later, I'm good, but, and then three hours later, maybe a few smokes, a few beers, actually, I'm not that good. Mm -hmm. And so that sequence in this uh, element of duration cinema was about having two actors really just get to a place where they can chart that course and go from, I'm good, to, I'm not really good. And Brian and Stefan did such a great job that when Nick and I got the footage, um, and I'll say this, you know, we shot that scene pretty standard, shot reverse shot. We had two cameras. It was our last day of production in New York. And it felt to me like the energy between Stefan and Brian was being passed back and forth. So we kicked one camera offset, put the one camera on a slider, and it took a lot of faith because now you're handcuffing the editors. It was like, you know what? Let's just slide and pan back and forth. When Brian gives his energy to Stefan, let's go to Stefan. When Stefan sends the energy back, let's send it back to Brian. And in that way, this move between the two of them is starting to gel. And you can really feel how Stefan James, his character, Fani, yeah. could become Daniel, Brian Tyree Henry, who's been so deeply affected you know, by systemic injustice, mass incarceration, the corruption of, uh, of the law. And so then I come in there with the scene, and I'm like, bruh, so I got this 12 minute scene. And uh, I always put, wanted to put Miles Davis Blue and Green into a movie. So I was like, hey, we're gonna, we gonna put that Miles Davis Blue and Green in. <laughs> and then, but then Nick, what I love about Nick and I, we don't, we don't fight, but we sometimes get into discussions. <laughs> and, and, and Nick was like, bruh, it, it, it needs score. And I, I got him saying bruh now, too. He's like, he's, like, he's, he's, he's like, bruh, I think we need score. And I was like, but the Miles Davis is doing it all. I don't think we need score. He's like, no, 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 I think we need score. And typically, when you introduce score, you turn the needle drop off. And so we did that, mm -hmm. turned the Miles Davis off. And then we were like, mm. 
it feels like now we're in the room. And so uh, you guys just saw the film. When the two characters first walk into the apartment, uh, Tish and Fani, when they first make love, this re and this room was so loud, I love it. This really big, the most lush romantic song plays, a song called Eros. So Nick took Eros, and what'd you do with it, bro? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that we discovered, in, and it was a week in April, I mm -hmm. think it was in April, where we basically discovered this whole other parallel universe of the sound for the film, which was taking the music, the, the music of love, the music of joy, the music of family that I had written for these other sequences, and distorting it and morphing it. And you were using the term, you were saying, how do we break it? Mm -hmm. And it was actually from a conversation that we had in that week where you know, we were sort of saying, you know, in, in Moonlight, there was this idea that we had had early on of taking chopped and screwed music and applying that technique to the music that I was writing. So what if I wrote you know, my own music, wrote it, recorded it, and then chopped and screwed my own score for the film. And that was this kind of technique that we really explored in Moonlight. And for Beale Street, there was a moment where we're like, what are we, you know, is there something like this? And I remember that week we said to ourselves, you know, there's no rules. Mm -hmm. Like, there are no rules. Like, we can do anything if it makes the film powerful, if it's part of this film. And that's what we started to do, where we took these elements of love and we distorted them and morphed them and broke them. And so what you start hearing as Daniel and Fani are having this conversation, first you start hearing the blue and green and it starts getting a little bit ethereal because I'm running it through this very, very long tail reverb. So it's starting to get almost kind of like your, percept your sense of perception is changing. And then all of a sudden you start hearing this rumbling and this sort of like grinding and this coming up from, you know, almost feels like it's coming up from the floorboards. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the cello that's playing in the making love sequence earlier, but it's now been, distorted and it's, it feels almost horrific. And so this idea of creating this kind of almost like doppelganger universe mm -hmm. that's... that's well, we're, we're the same thing that symbolizes joy exactly. and birth, that, that's literally going to bring a child into this exactly. world is now a symbol of torture of, and despair. Of horror and injustice. Because it's been corrupted by uh, the circumstances these young men have to face. So yeah, I mean, it was really cool to work on because normally when you, like, when you put the score, you turn the, you turn the needle <laughs> drop off, but I remember saying to Nick, hey, what if we just like play exactly. blue and green? Let's just, yeah, just keep it going. Let's what just keep play going? it. Yeah. And so as you see Brian Tyree Henry really descend into himself, hopefully you guys felt it, but that song starts to drift just all around the room. And it's like, yeah. what am I feeling right now? And it's like, it's just pain, you know? It's really just like deep, deep pain. And that actually opened the door for these other sequences. So for example, when Tish is uh, meeting with the lawyer Hayward, mm -hmm. and you're hearing this, you know, we're taking different elements of score and, and distorting them and bending them. And then, for example, the Officer Bell sequence. Yeah, That's okay. another, this, the, these, so there's a mapping where those part, those sections of the film are linked in that sort of doppelganger kind of a way. And we thought we were slick because we named all like the lovey stuff, like storage, <laughs> eros. But then of course, when the Officer Bell is there, it's called hypertension. Why? Take a mm. while, guys. <laughs> um, and then what's the other one? Oh, PTSD. PTSD, PTSD yeah. 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 It's the song we call with Brian and, and Stefan. Yeah. That came on my Spotify playlist today and stressed me out in the middle of my day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll do that, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about those moments when you know, you're working with such a talented composer. You have all, such, so many ideas for, for ways to use music. But those moments when you decide, I don't want any music at all, there's no score here at all. I was noticing watching again today that, say, the prison sequences, when they're face to face, you, it feels so intimate and close. And I wonder if part of that is because the, sound, the, the score just drops out in those moments for yeah. the most part. Yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think everything's a tool. You know, I think that, um, you know, I think cinema is always chasing literature. You know? I think when you read a novel, it's so immersive because everything is in your head. You're literally hearing the voices in your head, you're seeing the scenes. If it's a really good writer, you're smelling the smells. It's all your, every aspect of your brain is just totally activated. With cinema, it's a very passive experience. Um, but if you think of the room that we're in as another brain, and you guys are sitting inside of it, then yeah, I'm stimulating you by having sound everywhere. And just like uh, the last Star Wars film, which was so controversial, when the sound drops out, that's a stimulation as well, because now something else has to be activated. So I think Nick and I and James, we're always pretty active about it's why the dialogue in the movie comes from the front, but Tish's voice comes from everywhere. 
where she's speaking mm -hmm. voiceover. Right. And so it's just a, a way of manifesting or trying to utilize all the tools. And sometimes the abundance of things is very effective, but also the lack of things can be just as effective as well. Yeah. I'm going to take a couple of questions from our friends watching the live stream. Hello, friends on the live stream. Hi Should there. I look right here or? <laughs> yeah, they're right back. There's a camera right there. We'll start with uh, Jefferson from Facebook. Hi, Jefferson. Uh, he says, uh, how much research into Baldwin's other writings did you do for this project? Uh, for this project, uh, not much. You know, the book is uh, really dense. You know, it's uh, only a 200-page book, but it's really, really dense. If you've read much of Baldwin's writing, you understand what I'm saying. Um, it takes 20 hours to read this book. It takes two hours to watch the film. So everything I needed was within the housing mm -hmm. uh, of the book. Uh, but I was familiar with much of Mr. Baldwin's work. I've heard uh, you say that Giovanni's Room is your favorite. Are you going to snap up the rights to that one, too? Well, bro, easy, easy, <laughs> easy, easy. No, I, I think that uh, Giovanni's Room is, uh, is there for someone else who has a more direct relationship to that experience yeah. uh, to make. And I'm, I'm good. You know? yeah, you, yeah, Underground Railroad you're working on now and quite yeah, full, just, full dance card. Just that little bitty thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Laura from Facebook says, how did you two start collab collaborating and meet? You know, it's, it's actually, it's actually so kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you want me to start with? Okay. okay, well, okay, so we, uh, <laughs> we I, was, uh, I was actually, I was scoring The Big Short in 2015, and um, that summer, uh, the two of the amazing producers who, uh, you know, we've worked with and um, who've produced so many incredible films, uh, Jeremy Kleiner and Dee Dee Gardner of Plan B, uh, I was having dinner with Jeremy one night, and uh, he actually got really emotional telling me about a script he'd read. And uh, it was Moonlight. And he, you know, uh, I said, could I read it? And I read it, and I was just blown away. And I said, is there any chance I could meet Barry somehow? And he said, you know, yeah. You know, so, so we, go to the, we, go, so we yeah. meet at the bar we at, at the Ace Hotel Ace downtown, downtown, downtown yeah. four in the afternoon. Yeah. Of course, we think, oh, we're just going to have a coffee. Coffee, but then coffee meeting. It's like a glass of wine in Manhattan. <laughs> so we sit there talking about UGK and Bach <laughs> and Mozart. For hours. We're for, just hours. Talking for hours. And, um, yeah. and I was like, hey, we should, uh, we should do this, man. Let's try it. And he was like, OK, cool. And then by the time I got home, he had sent me a playlist that had <laughs> no that had even more like classical music but also southern hip hop and he had he had sent me an email going hey that chopped and screw stuff you was talking about man i think that's really interesting now here's the thing that happened a month ago, two months ago, yeah. we were at this uh, festival in Belgium that's all about composers. So nobody wants to talk to my ass. Everybody wants to talk to him. <laughs> everybody wants to talk to Barry. But, but we, were doing a, we were doing a panel like this. <laughs> and afterwards, somebody came up to us from the audience and said, so am I to understand from your talk that you had never heard Nicholas's music before you hired him for Moonlight? And it never occurred to me. <laughs> I'd never heard a damn thing he had composed before <laughs> hired him for Moonlight. <laughs> but, 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 but here's the lesson. <laughs> it was just the vibe. It was just the vibe. It was just the vibe. And, and, I, and the people who sent him to me, I trusted that he was talented. But he understood what I wanted to do. He understood the material. And it was just the vibe. And so it was like, you got to leap at some point. Now, I, now, I, now, now I, I assume had the shit not worked they, out. No, of course. Had yeah. it not worked out, <laughs> then, then, then I would have been. to go, oh, but you yeah. listen to any of his music. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. what, what exactly. but, uh, but yeah, we just, we just yeah. clicked. It was a vibe. It was, no, it was amazing. It was an amazing, amazing time. Uh, one more question from the ether. Uh, did the process of adapting the novel into a script reveal anything new about the story to you? Uh, it did, man. It did. You know, it's one thing, again, to read uh, a book. You have all this interior, there's all this interior voice uh, for the characters. Something happens, the character or the, the, the author explains to you how it happened, why it happened, how the character feels. Um, a screenplay is a very streamlined uh, text. And so, so much of the iceberg, the stuff beneath the surface um, that Mr. Baldwin was writing about, it was really tricky to translate that to the screen. And you guys just watched the film. There were so many grenades in this film. Even though it was published in 1974, there's just so much about it that even today, just grenades, just sticks of dynamite everywhere, everywhere. And I realized very quickly um, how delicate I had to be, how sensitive I had to be to all those aspects of the material. And just as a reader, it just didn't occur to me. It just didn't. And I read it for the first time in 2010, which is a much different world than you know making the film in 2017 and 2018. Um, but yeah, adapting it, I realized a lot of things. Now, a few of those things were that a black woman uh, who's at the age of 47, 49, whatever, leaving the country for the first time by herself and going to meet a man to try to save her daughter's fiance, that putting a wig on and off, on and off, that's cinema. 
You don't need three pages of text. You just need two minutes with Regina King looking directly at the audience. Those things I discovered, and I was like, okay, this is why this needs to be translated to the screen. Yeah. As um, the last question for you, we're wrapping up. Um, but I, I want to ask you about so do, as dark as things get, there is this. It is there is a, a note of hope and optimism very threaded through this film. Mm -hmm. And I was reading an, an interview from Baldwin in 1974 when the novel came out. He said, uh, every poet is an optimist, but on the way to that optimism, you have to reach a certain level of despair to deal with your life at all. That's from the Guardian piece, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, um, does that, that idea of the poet as an optimist, does that ring true with your work on this film? Uh, it does. I think also, too, I think the, the history of the lives and souls of black folks uh, in this country, and on this planet, to be honest, um, has to be shot through with optimism because we've had to go through so much suffering and despair. And I feel like the, the romance and the love, the family dynamics of the book, I think it was in some ways Baldwin's thesis that these have been the things that have allowed us to somehow sustain ourselves and build communities, build these Bill Streets, whether they're in Harlem or Miami or Memphis or Watts or Chicago, anywhere else. And so I do think that that was in the DNA of the source material. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope it's present in the film as well, because I do think if there was a point to this film, is that somehow we have to find a way. Dave Franco has his line, which is not in the book, uh, I'll be honest, where he says, I'm just my mother's son. Sometimes it's the only thing that makes a difference between us and them. The us and them you assume is black and white, um, maybe it is. But I think what he's really saying is nature versus nurture. Those of us who've been nurtured, either by our communities or our loved ones or our partners, and those of us who haven't. And if we haven't, how do we know we have the capacity to love? So um, I do think this idea of optimism, um, it comes part and parcel with the piece. And I hope it's the last thing when you walk out of here after this talk you take with you. And it is the last thing you're going to walk out of here with. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you.